we're gonna wait a few minutes for folks to roll in. Welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome. We're gonna wait probably 60 more seconds for people to keep rolling in um, and then we'll get this show on the road. Thanks for joining us today. We're here, um, I'm here in gray Detroit, very gray today, um, but hoping for some sun soon. Um, thanks for being here and we're just gonna wait a little bit longer for people to keep rolling in. Okay, I'll get started with my spiel. Um, so hi everybody, um, I'm Adam Desjardins, the Programs Manager at Culture Source. Um, for those of you who might be new to Culture Source, we are a regional arts service organization based in Southeast Michigan. Um, that encompasses Detroit, Metro Detroit, Ann Arbor, Down River, Oakland County, Macomb County, um, and the seven counties of um, uh, Southeast Michigan. Um, today you're joining us for one of our digital convenings. Um, we do our work through basically three pillars, one of which is convenings and programs, um, usually in person, but these times it's online um, and digitally. Um, we also do our work through re-granting initiatives and funding opportunities to support the wider arts and cultural sector here in Southeast Michigan. Um, and we also do our work through research to better understand how we can support um, the arts and cultural sector through our programs and through our funding opportunities and just better understand what's happening um, with the arts and cultural sector um, to you know, better support. Um, today, you are here as a part of our one of our, one of our digital access to the arts programs, um, which is centered all around arts education, entitled Youth Programs and Summer Camps: Arts Education and Instruction Online. Um, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, this is our fourth in a seven series, seven part workshop series um, focused on. Um, what is the online futures of arts and culture work? So we're excited to be really honing in on um, arts education today and thinking about um, how it's played out over the past year and what will it continue to look like too um, as you know we go back into a blended future of online and in-person work. Um, so a little bit more about our digital access to the arts program. Like I said, right now is um, one of the seven part online programs. Um, these are also followed by how to focus hack sessions as well, um, just to you know get a little bit more tactical with some of our skill building and learning as it pertains to the future of arts and culture work online. Um, we also just launched uh, a new initiative. We have a tech expert in residence. Um, so if you haven't checked that out yet, it's a really great opportunity to meet with our tech expert in residence, John Riley, um, who will be providing one-on-one -on -one support in digital strategy, ideation, and innovation. He's really great. Um, so take advantage of this opportunity because um, he knows a lot about both technologies and systems for nonprofits, but then also, you know, where tech and arts are working and how they're working um, currently and what's the future looking like and how can we just better prepare for those strategies as well. So please sign up for that um, if you haven't checked that out yet. The link is in the chat. My colleague Penny Maria is dropping all the relevant links in the chat. So check those out. Um, we also are doing some research about um, digital access, well, about online futures of arts arts and culture work um, with Eight Bridges Workshop. Um, so they basically um, have been really attuned to the tech and art space. They worked recently with the Ford Foundation, Knight Foundation and National Endowment for the Arts on a research initiative trying to study where Arts, where artists and um, artists who work at the intersection of arts and technology, um, how they're working, how they need support, what we can do to better support them. And so they're really tapped into this tech and art space and are doing some research with us to better, better understand our cultural sector here in Southeast Michigan and how we can um, better support uh, arts organizations in their technological infrastructures and capacities and just take a snapshot of this moment and um, learn how to better support uh, organizations doing this type of work. Um, and then announcements coming soon. We just recently closed our 
funding program as a part of our digital access for the arts program um, in which 16 $5,000 grants for culture source members will be made um, to make investments in sustainable technologies that support and enhance their digital and online work. So stay tuned for those announcements um, once we release those. Um, this whole uh, program is in partnership with the Rocket Community Fund. We're super grateful for their partnership and collaboration and thinking through and designing this entire program um, and its many different pillars. Um, so a huge shout out to the community sponsorships team there at the Rocket Community Fund. Um, some upcoming programs, uh, we have immediately following this program, a hack session with lighting and audio, on lighting and audio um, with Detroit Public Television. This is the part two um, of a program that we did with them last month, another hack session. Um, DPTV has a really amazing, you know, broad set of knowledge as it pertains to how to make TV, which is essentially what we're all doing these days online. So how can we tap into some of their knowledge around lighting and audio um, to just learn about, you know, how we can better and make our, our programs more professional in terms of lighting, in terms of audio, in terms of technical capabilities too. Um, next week, we have our spring biennial member meeting. Um, this is a twice annual convening that we do um, with our arts and cultural sector here in Southeast Michigan around, you know, big ideas and questions we have about, you know, the arts and cultural sector. And we're really excited to be joined by um, two awesome presenters and speakers. Um, one is Rev Moose um, of the National Independent Venue Association, NIVA. You might know them from the Save Our Stages um, program that's happening right now and that has got, gained a lot of traction nationwide and internationally and also is um, a huge grant program that will be, um, you know, supporting uh, independent venues and, and theaters and concert halls and all sorts of um, venues throughout the, the nation. So we'll be joined by Rev Moose, Moose, who's their director, and then also Angelique Power from the Field Foundation of Illinois. Um, so uh, Angelique has really reinvigorated and reinvented the Field Foundation as a foundation that supports racial equity work. And um, she'll be talking about how, you know, she did that work of taking the foundation and kind of reinventing it in this, this type of way and refocusing it onto racial equity work. And then also what that's looked like in terms of supporting their arts and culture partners at the Field Foundation and through that lens of racial equity work. So join us for that because Angelique is really awesome and a force to be reckoned with. Um, and then our next digital access for the arts program will be protecting content online, legally and secure. Um, so it will be a real deep dive into security of content, what that looks like from like a legal perspective um, as it pertains to copyright and intellectual property, but then also what that looks like from a cyber secure um, uh, perspective, learning about, you know, how do you protect your organization's work um, securely um, so that, you know, you don't have any privacy breaches or anything. So please join us for that. That'll be really interesting. And we have some great um, folks lined up for that program. Um, of note, um, we have a funding opportunity available. Culture Source is the regional re-grantor for the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. Um, and recently they've expanded their re-granting initiatives to include um, arts equipment and supplies uh, grants and then also bus grants too. So please check those out on our website. We are the re-grantor for Wayne County, which includes Detroit and Wyandotte and, um, you know, basically all of kind of Wayne County is essentially. So please um, check that out. And then if you are tuning in from Macomb County, check out the um, Anton Center for the Arts. If you're tuning in from uh, Washtenaw County, please check out um, the Arts Alliance. So really investigate that grant opportunity because it's a great um, opportunity to support arts equipment, supplies, and bus grants. Um, and then also a reopening resource from the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, they'll be hosting a webinar on their reopening guide, which is really great, um, a resource that they just commissioned and launched a few weeks ago. Um, and they'll be doing a program surrounding this guide uh, next week from 3 to 4 p.m. on Tuesday with um, none other than our favorite guy, Dr. Anthony Fauci. So check that out um, as well. The link is in the chat to that too. Um, today we have our wonderful graphic reporter, Yen Azaro here again. Um, Yen is beaming in from Ypsilanti, Michigan, and she is an artist and graphic reporter and activist and does a lot of really amazing arts focused work in Ypsilanti. So thanks Yen for being here and for sharing your visuals with us. 
And a huge thank you to all of our partners who support us in supporting um, the arts and cultural sector here in Southeast Michigan. Really um, grateful for your support. And lastly, without further ado, um, we have really wonderful group of people here today. And I say group because we do have a true group of people here uh, beaming in from all over the nation uh, to join us for this program, all focused on arts education. We thought it'd be a really great opportunity to you know, go national with this program and um, invite some outside perspectives and thinkers and speakers um, to connect with our regional context here in Southeast Michigan. Um, and also to go statewide too, um, as Heather um, from Maya, which is the Michigan Arts Education Instruction and Assessment Project, um, will be moderating um, today's conversation. So I'm excited to pass it over to Heather. You don't have to hear anything more from me, but I'll be in the chat, you know, dropping links when relevant. And yeah, Heather, welcome and thanks for moderating today's conversation. Thank you so much for this opportunity. What a treat to be able to gather with all of you today. So my role with Maya is that I serve as the professional learning director. Um, and as we welcome you to today's discussion, I would also like to invite you to just welcome this moment so that we can settle in and we can feel our feet on the floor and our bodies in our chairs and we can invite an elongated exhale as we settle in. With our Maya work, uh, we focus on really three areas. So we serve arts educators throughout the state of Michigan and beyond. Um, and our work is really centered on three things. So the first is best practice for arts educators and specifically how the assessment process completes the learning cycle. And within that work, we really emphasize the benefits of performance assessment because ultimately this is the work that helps, helps us as arts educators get to know what students know by how they know it. And that is through the demonstration of their skill within the creative process. So Maya has created 360 performance assessments in dance, theater, music, and visual art. And all of these are relevant to not only the K-12 arts classrooms, but these could be relevant to arts organizations that are providing education outside of that context um, for multiple uh, data points and ways to support your ultimate programming. We also focus on the infrastructural lens and through the Meyer work, we've developed a blueprint for high quality arts education, as well as a program review tool. And these pieces help school districts or arts education organizations identify where they are, as well as map where it is that they would like to go. Um, and then ultimately, we too are focused on community of practice. So in this, we are convening arts educators, um, which can sometimes feel like an isolating position, especially in school districts where there may be very few arts educators um, within a single building or within a district. Um, but this expands into our arts community organizations as well. And so our goal is to continue to have um, relevant and meaningful conversations where we can draw support from one another, as well as provide resources that make the lives of professional arts educators easier along the way. And so to join you in this conversation um, is a real treat because here in this opportunity, uh, we would like to think of today's conversation as an opportunity for groupthink. Um, so that as we have, as we are about to introduce our panelists, I would also invite those of you that are beaming in from work or home, wherever you may be, to consider yourselves as informal panelists, where we can uh, learn from you just as much as we can from these leading organizations that may have a, a bigger stature than what uh, we are representing in our in our own state. Um, depending on where where we are. So with that, I would like to invite our panelists to introduce yourselves with your name, your organization and the role that you serve there. And I'd like to start with Elena, please. Oh, this is so exciting. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Ewens, and I am a project manager with Merrill Arts Philadelphia. I'm really excited to be here to share my experiences with you and also answer all the questions that you may have. I'm excited, really excited. Thank you, we're so glad that you're here as well. Uh, Lisa. Hi everyone, uh, I have the honor and pleasure of working with Elena at Mural Arts Philadelphia. Uh, we serve over 2000 young people across Philadelphia uh, year round. And so uh, we're really excited to be part of this conversation today. Thank you for having us. Excellent, and Karen. Hi everyone, my name is Karen Cueva. I'm the Assistant Director for Learning and Engagement Programs at Carnegie Hall's Well Music Institute. 
it's a big mouthful, but the joy of my work is supporting music educators um, in public schools and community music programs across the country. I'm very glad to also be here with my colleague Doug Beck today. Great, Doug. Hey, thanks, Karen. Thanks, everyone. Delighted to be with you. I'm Doug Beck. Uh, I'm the director of artist training programs at Carnegie Hall. And uh, for the purpose of this conversation, I that's uh, a big chunk of that work involves running a summer program for three national youth ensembles, two uh, orchestral programs and a jazz band program for high school age students, 14 to 18. Excellent. And Vanessa. Hi, everyone. I'm Vanessa Thomas. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Director of Education Activation and Engagement at the Kennedy Center, which sits on the traditional lands of the Nakachtank and Piscataway people. And I'm really thrilled to be here with you this afternoon or morning, Excellent. depending on where you are. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. So today's conversation um, sort of aligns with the mission that that we use it in the Maya work as I had already described. And I should also mention that the work of Maya is a project that's conducted by the Michigan Assessment Consortium that receives continued funding from the Michigan Department of Education. And our outreach support is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, which has been um, instrumental for us in building brilliant partnerships um, with organizations such as CultureSource. So today's conversation examines three components that I think are universal to programming um, wherever you are, regardless of whether you're not, whether you are working with students or you are working with adults as some of our panelists are doing today. And so these are, what is the context that we find ourselves? Uh, what's the content that we are offering? And finally, what is the growth and impact and the evaluation of the work that we do? Because ultimately when we consider how we serve our population, whether that be students or educators, um, the program that we offer tends to, I think, focus on these questions, these driving questions of what is it that we want them to experience? How are we making sure that we are providing that experience? And then what, how do we get to do it again? Because ultimately that's what we want, right? We want retention of all of these brilliant minds and faces and bodies. And we also want um, continued to support from uh, the people that make all of this work possible, our funders, our partners, and so forth. And as this year has turned everything upside down and sideways, I think of this as a great opportunity for innovation as well as reflection, which is exactly what happens in the creative process. So I would like to direct these questions to this extent um, in this opening part one context. So the question is, how has education programming for your organization, regardless of whether you're working with students and or adults, um, how has that shifted within the last eight, 18 months? So I'd love just a little snapshot of what learning looked like pre-COVID pre and what it's looked like um, in the interim. And at this point, I would also invite our informal panelists, if it's not too distracting for you, that you can also contribute your experience in the chat um, so that we have a sense of what you have been experiencing and moving through as well. And so I'd like to start uh, with our panelists uh, with Vanessa, please. Thank you, Heather. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, today I'm actually going to focus on our Kennedy Center Dance Lab, which is a pre-professional training program for dancers in high school, typically grades nine through 12, um, more skewing towards 10 through 12, but there are some really phenomenal ninth graders out there who we love to bring into the fold. And, um, but we also offer programs in music education, both vocal and orchestral. Uh, so as you can imagine with a dance program, we launched Dance Lab in 2019. So it was a brand new program that we had launched locally um, before the pandemic. And we had convened in person in our new studios. We actually kind of opened the new building at the center and we were with the dancers uh, for two weeks. It's an intensive from about nine o'clock until six o'clock every day. Um, and then the world caught fire and we had to make some decisions around how we were going to transition the program, if we were going to transition the program. And this was also in the context of, as I'm sure many people experienced, a lot of furloughs and layoffs and a lot of strain on staff. And so, you know, we decided that we have a real commitment to the young artists that we serve 
and that we really wanted to provide something for them. And so we decided that we would move forward with an online program and we had to get very clear about what our core learning objectives are, very much to what you were saying, Heather, um, and what we would or would not do. What are the things that for safety, for health, especially when you're talking about dance, when you don't know what environment the student is going to be dancing in, what are the things that we have to consider? So we went ahead and surveyed the students. Um, we shut down at a time where we already knew who the cohort of students would be. So we, we were able to have direct communication with people about their very specific needs. And that was needs in terms of tech, in terms of capacity, because young people found themselves in situations where they were being caregivers um, to family members and did not have the kind of time that they would have had in a kind of unfettered summer. Um, and so in, the, in that communication and also what they were interested in, you know, what's most important to you about this program? What is the thing that you don't wanna do from home? And so once we kind of landed those things, we moved into building the program. And so we decided to shorten it. We didn't wanna do two weeks. We did 10 days. Um, we did shorter days between uh, 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Uh, that wasn't true for all of our programs because those programs were already national. Uh, our scope for Dance Lab was still local. So we knew that that timing would work for the students we were serving. Um, and then we kind of went for it based on the feedback we had. That's excellent. What I love about that is really how you are capturing student voice. And I, I get a sense from, from you and from what I've read about your program that that isn't just something that is exclusive to, what the, to the experience that you've just described, but that is something that is continuously folded within the work that you uh, do even in the best of times um, and how important that is in the engagement of, of students. Absolutely, um, it's core to the mission, interest. you know? Yeah. Dance Lab yeah. was founded with the intention of how do we impact the field? And impacting the field starts with the young people you're sending into the field. And so they must have right. voice, they must have agency, they must have right. growth mindset and cultivating those things is really important for us within the programs. Yes, absolutely. I love that. All right, so let's um, move to uh, Doug, please. Thank you. Um, I guess in speaking, youth ensemble programs, which are in essence a kind of summer camp. Uh, it was very much like I think the Kennedy Center programs, intensive, you know, experiences uh, based on, you know, a lot of performing together, forming these ensembles, uh, work with faculty um, at different sizes of uh, configuration. Uh, and a lot of performance. Uh, you know, there's a there's a touring and performing component. Uh, so no, so none of those things really were possible in a virtual space. And, and we also went through um, a period of evaluating what we could offer. Uh, how should we do it? Um, indeed, should we proceed at all? Given that uh, you know the the essence of of playing in an orchestra is is, is that you know, collaborative experience in, in the same space. Um, but we, we did feel that, that if we could offer the students something, uh, it would be meaningful uh, given how unconnected uh, many of them had been from the start of the pandemic to other musicians like themselves. Since we are a national program, one of the, the great things we're able to do is bring a like-minded group of peers from all around the country together. Uh, so we really made a pretty big shift in uh, the type of instruction that we could offer and the type of coaching and and based on what the technology allows. Uh, you know, we, we, we moved to uh, an emphasis on one on one interactions for lessons, uh, smaller group activity, really just much more actual contact with faculty, the total number of hours were reduced, but it was it was a much more individualized experience. Um, since with with music in particular, the the, the lag times that come with interacting uh, synchronously online make it really impossible uh, to do any playing together. Uh, 
but uh, we also we also wanted to replicate you know the work of the full ensemble, and so there were there were several projects uh, of the sort of tiled at home uh, recording uh, that that I'm sure many of you have seen uh, different musical groups do, uh, and that did that did in the end prove to be uh, I think meaningful and rewarding. We were a little hesitant since um, so much of the work is really done at the level of, of, of video and audio editing and, and taken a little bit out of the hands of the individual student. Uh, but I think we were able to, we were able to give them some creative prompts for how they film themselves in, in different ways to, to really uh, give them voice in, in the end product. Um, probably more to say, but I think I'll, I'll leave it at there. And we're now headed into a, a hybrid model for this coming summer that will will hopefully involve some um, in-person activity a, as well as uh, a virtual component during, in essence, a kind of quarantine period that will will enable us after that to, to bring them together uh, in person. Wonderful. And having a couple of musicians in my own home with my own two kids, I can I can sort of testify to the change of their practice habits, working in a virtual capacity and having to record themselves and how that has been really fascinating to observe their depth of interest in their own work and evaluation um, in order to get that recording, in order to ship it off to their instructors. It's been uh, not necessarily their preference in the beginning, but I think they've both thrived under that experience. Karen, I would, I'm wondering what you would add Sure. So in terms of how we've been supporting music educators through two different programs, our Music Educators Workshop, uh, which is a professional development series for New York City public school educators. We used to meet once a month at Carnegie Hall to have uh, day-long discussions around best practices around teaching. Um, we've moved that obviously to a virtual forum. Uh, we get a lot of um, noticings that people miss the catering, <laughs> but apart from that, uh, we are still keeping a lot of the values of the program around building community and ensuring that we are holding a, a lot of emotional space to be able to uh, understand how teachers oftentimes have been really thrown into the deep end around virtual learning and what are the tech capacities and what are the ways that we're still imbuing joy in, in musical instruction uh, while at the same time having a theme around culturally responsive and sustaining education that is both happening in our music educators workshop as well as in Play USA, which is a national program uh, that works with teaching artists and program administrators from community music programs across the country. Play USA is also a granting program, so we support financially as well through the Fund2 Foundation, um, uh, 19 of these organizations across the country. Um, and so this, this theme around culturally responsive and sustaining education has not only been um, a way to, to have a reflection space on what teaching is looking like right now, but also an inspiration and a motivation to have teachers really centering um, culturally responsive pedagogy in a time where a lot around teaching is changing. And it's so easy to go back to the normal ways of teaching. Um, and so we want to encourage teachers to, to continue diversifying their repertoire, their curriculum, um, and, to be, and to be doing that uh, on a daily basis. Beautiful. We've been having very similar conversations. Um, and you know, I'm thinking about um, the way that we've been encouraging arts educators to move through the year has been to really examine how they're allocating time from performance standards to also create and respond standards and how that is really allowing them to offer a more well-rounded experience within the arts offering that they provide, knowing that the arts education component is something that we want to um, fold into the overall well-rounded experience of, of, the, of a child's education. But within that, when you're engaging in that more compositional and theoretical work, this invites even more intention behind, um, you know, culturally responsive teaching and really asking teachers to re-examine where are you coming from? Where do you think you're taking your students? And how are we doing that? Um, to what extent? So I appreciate and I echo your sentiments. Um, Good. So, yeah, so I'm wondering if we could go to Lisa. 
Sure. So uh, traditionally, we are a free after school program that young people would attend. And obviously, when COVID came around, uh, we had to really rethink that quickly. So uh, all of our teaching artists became uh, amateur video artists for a while, where they were going back to our roots and working on the elements and principles of design and art, um, really just trying to give short, quick um, video material for young people who you know, at the time we weren't providing regular classes for. So we were just trying to create content for young people, really trying to make sure that they had resources that they could use at home. So trying to build lessons around things you could find around your home. Um, the teaching artists put together some amazing creative videos uh, that we have on our website now called Homeschool. Uh, from there, we pivoted into a Google Classroom and uh, found some new tools that I'm gonna let Elena talk a little bit more about. We also found one of the big uh, challenges for us was making sure students were well supplied. So we had to send kits. Uh, so basically we tried to find the most efficient set of tools uh, that could really resource students properly where they were. Uh, so we, we've sent a lot of art kits out. We've also built art kits um, for different young people to make sure that they could really um, properly uh, be resourced in, in what they wanted to make. So uh, I'll turn it over to Elena to talk a little bit more about kind of some of the pivots we made in the classroom around design tools and, and things like that. So Elena, take it away. Gladly. So Google Classroom is a jungle upon its own. We had never really used it, never really considered using it. But upon inspection, we were like, OK, this is doable. So it was really fun to pivot to that. And then we also ended up finding a really nice uh, group design tool called Figma, which is where a lot of our instruction and kind of um, class assignments ended up being produced and shared and critiqued. And through using both of those, we were able to, similar to what we are doing now, screen share and go through the student work and critique or discuss some issues they may have had with the lessons or you know just regular struggles through becoming a confident artist excellent yes all of that right and so in this year has just continued to, to for us as educators to demonstrate our agility in this work and you know have opportunity to find new confidence in new areas and hopefully our students will take that modeling into their own lives as well Excellent. So as we move into part two of our conversation, um, you know, again, I would invite our viewers at home to be um, adding their thoughts to the to the document, um, the visual document or in the chat. And uh, let's think now to our content. So the question is, how do you define a successful experience for the people that you are serving um, based on the mission of your program? and or you could take some option as to what you'd like to answer here. Um, how are you identifying what students are gaining from the content form, uh, content and format of both the virtual and the in-person offerings, right? So if we think about what's the online through line, right? We've had the experience of pretty exclusively working with students in person and now we have flipped that lid. We are at this beautiful opportunity to discern what is the best format that serves the mission and could there be a variety of experiences um, dependent upon what the work demands and how do we adapt for that? So I'm curious um, either again, how are you defining the successful experience uh, based on the mission and or how are you developing that online through line as you push forward in our newest reality? And I'll move here starting with Karen, please. Sure. So I think our definition of success is hopefully always evolving, listening to a lot of continual feedback from participants, uh, all of these educators that, that we have the joy of working with. Um, I think for us is we're, if we're able to always hearken back to the pillars of our program to, to be able to build community, to be able to um, push teachers to explore what does it mean to be a culturally responsive educator and what is the um, in-classroom work around that and what is the personal work to do around that um, and then also to understand that educators um, whether they are siloed as one music educator in their school or whether they are a community music program that may also be doubling as a social service organization in many ways in their community, um, what are the ways that we're building community, uh, whether that's locally or nationally, so that folks have spaces for inspiration and accountability um, to be able to deepen their practice. 
Excellent. And I would even push into, you know, what is the assessment experience in terms of culturally responsive teaching, right? So that how how the format in which we choose to assess our students um, is that setting them up for success or we are relying on things that are already putting them at a deficit, relying on memorization and other things that, you know, aren't really the goal of what our mission is, perhaps, um, and may not set them up to really demonstrate what they know. Thank you for that. Doug. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think, you know, we we also with our young people are are constantly asking them for, you know, feedback through throughout the program, working with evaluators, surveying. And I, th I think the, the big discovery, um, especially in the music space where, you know, both from the perspective of our faculty and and our students and hearing even what you said, Heather, about your your own uh, children involved in music, that the, the technology is is more their friend, I think, than they imagined going in. And, and all of our faculty who had started to teach, you know, at um, the collegiate level in many cases uh, in the, the last months of uh, the prior academic year, you know, realized that they were, that there were new ways of um, using uh, Using the limitations uh, and turning them on their head into something that that could be helpful, um, and I think, you know, that's something that we we really try to take advantage of as we were designing the program, and really, to some extent, stumbled stumbled into. And I think our our at the end, oh my gosh, they're blowing leaves right outside the window all of a sudden. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to try to move slightly away. Um, what we discovered is that, uh, you know, we were we were in essence giving students tools to teach themselves. You know, learn how to use video to to record yourselves to listen in a way that you normally wouldn't do. This room is no better. Um, I'm going to stand in the hallway. Um, so that that was a that was a really wonderful finding, and I think it also suggested that we. We can have contact with students, uh, you know, outside of the limited period in the summer when they are directly with us, uh, and that's always been something we we found a little bit frustrating and limiting. They have this wonderful, intensive three or four week experience, and then we lose them again uh, until they may come back the next summer, and and in a strange way, the fact that we were able to interact successfully online makes it much more feasible to think about continuing those relationships online uh, in, in a way that that just never dawned on us in, in terms of running this kind of program that there would be a role for us to play if they are several hundred or thousand miles away. So so those are both, I think, you know, things that we took out of this that that will influence the way we continue to work with the students. Yeah, I love what you said about allowing the students to be their own teachers. Because I think what that demonstrates is, um, you know, that they're really learning to learn in that capacity because they're having to identify questions that they may not have arrived at when they're just receiving the information and translating that into process. So I so value that. And I also appreciate that your demonstration of adaption in real time. We just had a real summary of, yes, this is what the year has been. And my dog was going on blast right as that was happening for you. So. <laughs> You're not alone. Excellent. Let's uh, move to Lisa, please. Sure. So uh, in our program, again, um, we've always tried to focus on basic art skills, uh, youth voice, which is, you know, the five C's of, of youth development, really making sure that young people feel confident moving forward in the world. Uh, we're building future ready skills. We have a partnership with the Philadelphia Youth Network here. So it's really trying to build those soft skills for young people to really make sure that they move forward in whatever the way they'd like to. And then we always like the idea of building social consciousness. So how are you critically looking at your environment, critically looking at the world and thinking about where you wanna be in it and how you wanna um, align yourself. So I think um, those are kind of the things that we, we dove back into in a really clear way. And uh, I think we really tried to uh, just 
make sure that young people were excited to attend our classrooms. So build that community within Google Classroom online, which is a challenge when screens are on and off <laughs> and, and people are participating or not in the chat. Uh, and since we have kind of this year round vibe, it's, it's a really um, challenging thing to see how to do it virtually and how to, how to build that um, trauma-informed response to making sure like students are exhausted, they're fatigued, Zoom is, hard <laughs> and so really um, trying to uh, make sure that the spaces were comfortable and interesting and engaged and so uh, really just trying to build that comfortable space that folks were wanting to come to rather than designing something that, that we thought would be really amazing doing a lot of reflection and, and making sure that they, uh, they felt part of the space and wanted to, to be part of that experience. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Alina, what might you add? <laughs> My heart. Uh, I would just say that, yeah, creating that comfortable online space is difficult, but it's very, very possible. And I do feel like we definitely did that with the various sites that we had um, this past winter semester. So I just, all of that, Lisa, was great. And you just reminded me about how much I enjoy what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that is the best. Um, and, you know, I my background is in dance and I continue to teach movement and I've been surprised in this year at how um, some things that I didn't think would work in the same kind of way actually let them lend themselves to uh, for for movers to to go deeper, further and faster. Um, because they had some control over the space that they were using and what was visible to the others on screen and what was not. And they just had a different relationship of um, being witnessed and seen within that experience. Vanessa, I'm wondering how all of this has shown up for you as a fellow dancer. Yeah, I'm nodding vigorously because I think we were truly and delightfully surprised by how we were able to work within the medium and how there was actually a lot of value in working in this space. Um, we were able to, you know, it's when, when you have the, we keep the program intimate um, so that we can have really close contact with the young people and, um, they re and make ourselves approachable. We're always there with them. But, you know, when you have the boxes on the screen, you know, the class size was no bigger than the then the, the instructor could fit on a single screen. And we were commenting on how there might've been something that was happening across the studio that maybe you didn't notice when you were in person, but when everybody's there on the screen and we help them frame up their shots and we're getting these tight shots, we were actually able to see and give more feedback that was more precise in this environment. And that was something that we didn't anticipate. And it was really, really a powerful learning for us. Um, in terms of assessing student work, we have the, the privilege of having a research and evaluation team embedded in our education division. And, um, and so they, we survey, we ask questions. Uh, we say that we are focusing on resilience and readiness and relevance. And so we ask questions that say, have we done those things? How are you feeling at the end of this program? Um, the other way that we were able to look at their work is the culminating, each young person had a culminating project. They had to produce a 90 second video that was kind of positioning themselves as a dance artist and change maker in the world. And if you go to um, the website that Adam so thankfully dropped into the chat, you'll see some excerpts from that work. And in seeing what they produced, we were absolutely blown away. It told us, yes, they absolutely got it. And, um, and we did a screening for the families at the end. That was kind of our, in place of the recital or the open rehearsal, you know, let's all sit down, get our popcorn and watch these great short films. So we did a little film festival at the end of the program featuring the students' work. And that was really, um, really powerful for us and empowering for them. And something that's also really important to us you know, young people exist in communities. And so when we're with their caregivers and their caregivers are saying, my child is different in a really good way, 
that's another way that we come to understand the impact that the work is having. The, when, when they're educators who they're with year round, they're with us for two weeks, we can only take but so much credit, but there is a lot we can do in two weeks. You know, when their educators are saying, I am seeing a change in this young person after the time that they spent with you. So those are the ways that we kind of get that feedback on the work. The other thing for us was really making sure that we signaled that we were there for them. And so um, like neural arts, we sent them a care package. You're gonna get a tripod, you're gonna get a TheraBand, you're gonna get some other therapeutic tools so you can take care of yourselves in this moment, but you're also set up for success with the technology as best as we can support you in doing that. Um, and the, there was one other thing I wanted to highlight and it's gone from me. So if it comes back, I'll raise my hand. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, and if I don't see you, you know, drop it in the chat so that I make sure that I get to call you. You, gosh, makes me think of two, well, lots of things, but I'm going to focus on two. One is that, um, you know, screen dance and, and working in technology for professional artists is not new, but expecting that for students, I think is, and what a beautiful opportunity to really prepare them more accurately for what they're going to be engaging in, in a variety of media as they become professional artists, if they choose to, and if they don't, you know, technology is not going away. How we are interfacing in the world will be forever changed. And I just feel so inspired by um, the work that all of you are doing to that end, that really helping them understand that they are artists and to prepare them for the tools to, to go out and live a brilliant life. I commonly talk about the arts not only being about quality of life, but about developing a, a life of quality, right? And so how do we do that and how does that show up? Um, and that leads to the other piece that you touched on, which is social emotional learning. Oh, I, do, I see you, I'm gonna come back. And we've been talking about arts educators, um, about the connections that they need to make in to that translation for school administrators that have the lens about SEL, but do not necessarily understand how the arts fold into that. And I think of the arts really being the front line of social emotional learning, because that's what we're doing. We're asking you to sense your bodies in space. We're asking you to regulate your nervous systems just by singing and playing your instrument. And that I think is, is why our arts kids uh, close those achievement gaps because they're, we're preparing their physiology, but we're also preparing their minds and spirits. We're teaching them literally about um, conversation and relationship to others, and then to hold their world up against the landscape of the world all around them. Um, that's the power. So I'm so excited to hear all of you, you know, touch on that in those various ways. What were you going to, to add, Vanessa? The other thing is they are digital natives, right? And they may have been using the medium in a particular way. And it's just about saying, now you can use it in this way too. You know, that's, that's part of it. Um, and we also, as the people running the program, realized one of the instructors said this thing that other dancers in the room might relate to. We're like, we learned to dance from watching screens. Those music videos in the heyday of MTV and BET, that's how we learned dances. And we went, oh, wait, oh, yeah, we got this. You know, <laughs> we did this already. And um, the other thing I want to point out about the power of the online environment is kind of the eradication or flattening of calendar and transportation logistics. And so that made it possible for us to blow their minds with special guests, right? So we're like, we said, okay, who in the world do we want these young people to be in contact with? And we went out and got people so that when they, when they showed up, the kids were like, what, how am I in a room with only 20 other people? And like, Leslie Odom Jr., I don't understand, right? And had we been in person, there's no way we could have accomplished that because calendars would not have allowed for travel, calendars would, but if you just say, come pop, pop out a session for 30 minutes to come talk to these young people, they're like, oh, sure, I can do that. So that is one of the most powerful takeaways from this environment that I think we need to find ways to sustain is who we can connect people to across the globe. Yes, standing ovation completely. 
Um, uh, all right, so moving to our third part quickly. <laughs> Um, so in the Maya work, in our assessment world, we think about data as a storyteller, right? So like this is telling the story about what is our teaching really doing? What are our students understanding? How do we take them from where they are to where we want them to be? But then also, how are we communicating with the people who need to know the brilliance that are hap that's happening in our classrooms so that, again, we get to do it again? So I'm curious from you all, do you assess student work? And if so, what methods do you use? And, and this could be student work or this could be educator work, depending on, your, on the people that you're working with. How are you assessing the effectiveness of your programming? And Vanessa, I'll come back to you. I think it's, it's limited or limited to or as extensive as what I just described. You know, it's, um, it's what we hear in the feedback from the students themselves and the educators who support them year round and their families, but also in what they are able to produce coming out of the program. So those are kind of the, the limited ways in which we look at the effectiveness of the program. And it's still so powerful, right? Because it's that student testimony. And when we think about, at least in K-12, when we're thinking, especially now where band directors are concerned that because asynchronous teaching has been happening, they haven't been able to work their programs in the same way they have been. What does that mean for numbers moving forward in, in the future years and so forth? Um, you know, I think about the work that you're describing. Kids seeing other kids do cool things pulls them into your program. And then if you can also show up with, you know, the social engagement system, these five cranial nerves that, that change how we see how we speak, how we listen to the human voice, our facial expression, all of those things, like how we are building relationship and connection. Um, those are some other components. And again, when you've got video that can translate and people can feel connected to work um, of, of teachers as well as students. Excellent. Um, Doug, how about you? It's, I think quite similar, um, mainly because I, I suppose uh, in an intensive, you know, four week long program, the idea of measuring where they are at the beginning and the end for an individual student probably um, can't be fully quantified, but we do, we do a lot of surveying. We do work with external evaluators, um, firm called Wolf Brown, uh, that follows up um, with a cohort of the students over time in terms of measuring where they are, are they sticking with music, doing some interviews to understand, you know, the impact, um, both our program, but also the other supports they have in their own communities may, may have on their trajectory. Um, but, you know, we, 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 get a, we get a lot of useful information. Um, and I think, um, you know, to, to echo another, uh, another thing Vanessa said, you know, in our, post uh, program survey this year, the most popular single session we offered was was a kind of digital masterclass workshop with Jacob Collier, who's someone they wouldn't have had a chance to, to interact with. Um, but he was happy from his you know, home studio in London as a perfect embodiment of the DIY musician approach um, to meet with these students and inspire them and, and play a 20 minute private concert for them. Uh, uh, I, I never realized I'd, I'd hear 14, 15 year olds, you know, shouting in the chat for Moon River, um, you know, a tune from, <laughs> from whatever, back in the 60s, I guess. Um, in any case, so yeah, we, we, we do all of those things. I think also the testimonials from, um, our colleagues in the field who are running youth orchestras, the teachers, you know, we see them audition again the next year. Um, so th there's a lot of a lot of qualitative uh, assessment that we can do. Um, it's it's hard to reduce um, to raw numbers, but um, you know that's that's all input that constantly enables us to refine, you know, what seems to be working, what isn't, um, and, and, you know, move, move forward from there. Excellent. Karen. 
Sure. Yeah. Following up on that, um, our Play USA program does also work with, with Wolf Brown, and we have a number of surveys and conversations over the past couple of years to be able to chart what is the impact of engaging in Play USA's professional development on uh, the actual structure, the, the quality of teaching, and the program design of these organizations. And what we're finding is that a lot of these uh, a lot of these conversations are encouraging organizations to ask a lot of reflective questions on what are the purposes and values of their program, particularly in moments of crisis like switching to virtual learning, managing multiple pandemics, um, uh, the pandemic of, of anti-Black, anti-Asian racism, oppression, and also um, understanding that you know young people uh, are oftentimes now um, also caretakers at home and, and all of the different ways that, um, that young people and families are being impacted in these moments. Um, and so we're seeing that that is, that is one of the ways that's being impacted in terms of music educators workshop, just connecting to Vanessa and, and what Doug was saying earlier around, um, around the ways that seeing uh, yourself reflected and inspired by guests. Um, we had actually the DC based uh, fantastic group, the String Queens come and talk to our teachers just a couple of weeks ago, aren't they amazing? And um, uh, this is a, a string trio and they had recently just played on, on one of the inaugural concerts and they were coming to talk to our teachers, not only about their identities as artists, but also their identities as, uh, as K to 12 educators and um, to be able to have access uh, to, to be able to to, you know, have teachers feel like they can also embark on cultivating their own artistic identities, um, but also, you know, the day to day and the coffee and the, you know, all of the things that make teaching <laughs> a, a daily um, a challenge and joy and, and understanding that there is a community uh, beyond only educators, that there's a community of also additional guests that want to continue supporting and want to continue being in touch. And so, um, so we're definitely looking forward towards uh, understanding how we can continue to leverage this virtual space as a way of further connection. Yeah, what you said makes me think about how this year, I think, has insisted that we we allow for our whole selves to be acknowledged even our in our professional lives and in our classrooms for our students that we can see them for their whole identity and entity in a way that i think it can be easier to not necessarily think about their caregiving responsibilities outside of their classroom if when they are in our classroom we are only seeing what we see um, and i think i've spoken to many arts educators this year that have um, grappled with, but finally sort of yielded into, I am a whole person that shows up into this classroom space and I don't have to um, wear a mask in its entirety because that's not necessarily helping us create more connection. But if I remove that mask and I admit to my students, oh, I'm having a hard time with this or this isn't going particularly well, how are you experiencing that? Do you think you could help me out? Um, it's shifted that hierarchy a little bit in relationship, and I think that's been one of the interesting outcomes. Um, as difficult as it can be for some people to have their whole selves be acknowledged in that way, but um, I think that has been a, a profound shift. So thank you for that. Uh, would love to hear at this point from, where am I? From Lisa. Sure. So uh, on our teaching artist front, again, we work with a team um, year round. And so we found that they want more meetings and more professional development and just more opportunities to, to share and talk and, and have opportunities to connect, um, share their experiences in the classroom, troubleshoot together. Uh, we do site observation. So we have a team that's in the classroom trying to, you know, problem solve with them. Uh, we, we try to bring in speakers uh, with some frequency. We have an amazing roster of visiting artists that we're able to bring into the classroom, but we've been able to do that more with Zoom, which has been really wonderful. And, um, you know, we get evaluations from testimonials from teacher, teacher partners that we work with. Um, the site observations give us a lot of good feedback on the, the students and where they are and where our teaching artists are and where they need support. And then parents also provide feedback um, for us. So, so that's kind of from like the, the larger lens of, of feedback from the community. But Alina can talk a little bit more about, 
kind of the classroom experience and, and what we're really learning from our young people. I sure can. So, I mean, in the classroom, it's a constant conversation. We want to know if the kids are comfortable. We want to know if the kids are having fun. Um, we often send uh, evaluations at the end of every semester just to say, like, how, what have you learned? Uh, do you feel as though you are comfortable leading a project doing this with this specific task or this specific art uh, tool or what have you? And then we also uh, receive a lot of quantitative and qualitative data from that. But I mean, it's an ongoing conversation, that ongoing conversation of asking the students, are we having a good time? What can I do to make this better for you guys? Um, how did this go? Would you want to do this differently in the future? And if so, how? I'm sorry, we can't necessarily get that specific tool, but we can figure out something else to do instead. Um, conversations with the kids. They're little people and they have opinions and we wanna make sure that we get them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So at this point, um, we would like to open up for uh, questions from those of us that have been joining us virtually. And so the first question that I've received is, how have organizations been handling the digital divide in the communities they serve? Also, similarly, a question from Vanessa, for national programs or even regional, how might we remove geographical barriers to arts education access through the digital space? Um, so if you, as one of our panelists, has a response, give me a wave. I have to admit that I don't see all of you at the same time. So if you're waving and I don't see you, just come off of mute. So I, I guess I can try my best at this one. <laughs> uh, the digital divide is real and awful and really tough for an organization to figure out. Um, the Philadelphia School District distributed a ton of Chromebooks to, to young people, but they didn't make it everywhere. Uh, we have digital access centers, uh, which are places where young people can go and, and get free meals and get internet access. Um, so there are 76 of those across Philadelphia where young people can, you know, access those tools. We've also been providing kits to those sites. So young people aren't just stuck in screens all day, but they have a tactile art break. Um, we've, we've done, you know, banner kits. We've done mobile mural kits, <laughs> uh, trying to just give them tools to use in those spaces so they have access to something else. Um, and, you know, we've lost a lot of students because of the digital divide. Um, and we're trying to figure out how to how to solve for that. It's it's a it's it's a terrible reality. And um, I'm not sure that we've cracked the code. Uh, but those are those are the things that, that we've seen in Philadelphia that have helped a little. Thank you. Anyone else? I'd, I'd support that, Lisa. You know, we we had the uh, benefit of not having to address that the students that we were about to serve all reported that they were pretty well well supported but we had the conversation do we need to prepare and find budget to send hotspots um, but something we did do because we knew there would be strain on bandwidth in certain homes where there are multiple kids learning at home and there are parents working at home was we made sure we had a lot of asynchronous content and so and we recorded everything that may have been synchronous so that if a student was unable to access it in real time because of those barriers, then they could go back and still derive some benefit from having it available asynchronously. And so that was our kind of best attempt at addressing it, given the circumstances we were working within. Doug. Maybe just to speak to the broader point about, you know, geographical barriers and not perhaps being as, as meaningful as we once thought. Uh, certainly that's been, been something we discovered. And I think also, um, again, echoing Vanessa, just like the, the availability of folks, um, uh, you know, particularly over the last year of the pandemic is, is, a little bit, uh, is a little bit more flexible in terms of being available for digital programming, either synchronous or asynchronous. Um, you know, one of the things, um, that a, a little kind of focus group of our current students uh, last week suggested to us as, as a number of them had been unsuccessful applicants um, before they were admitted to one of our NYO programs is 
uh, you know, making programming available to, to the entire pool of students who, who uh, audition for these programs. And I think that would have been inconceivable in a, in a, in a space where we, we, we haven't figured out to some extent how to do it, uh, but we're now actively, you know, planning some events to which we can invite a, a much larger group to join. Um, and we've also used social media tools to, to put educational programming out there. We, we did a series um, of Instagram lives that featured both professional musicians as well as, as recent alums of our program, each, uh, you know, focused on a different instrument um, over a, you know, seven or eight week period, you know, talking about how to prepare for any audition, looking at some popular, you know, audition material and excerpts. Uh, and, you know, that's, again, the kind of thing that we, we, we wouldn't have uh, thought we had the resources to, to pull off uh, in a pre-pandemic time. And yet, you know, the technology makes it quite simple. Uh, it doesn't even need to be produced. Those two people can have a direct conversation um, and it populates automatically on, on our channel. So uh, even small things like that can enable you to, to broadcast a, a message and reach that oboist in a town of 80 in Pinedale, Wyoming, who is four hours from, from anything. And, and that's a very powerful uh, resource. I love that you mentioned what the students said, Doug, because um, that's something we found too, these wonderful, brilliant humans. When we asked them about returning to in-person versus online, um, you know, the ones who are able to do in person, they said, we prefer in person, but we think you should keep a digital program for students who may have a barrier in turn that's financial or geographic. And so in their thinking, they're already thinking broadly about their peers who they may never come into contact with. And so we are seriously considering how do we run a digital track and an in-person track going into the future. And it also makes me think that from the long game, you know, what is our involvement maybe in advocating legislatively to make sure that people in our in all of the state have what they need in terms of being able to access that divide, um, particularly as states might be receiving relief funds. Um, how are they spending those dollars and can we build more equity in that capacity as well that too, I think falls under arts advocacy. Um, uh, I think Karen was was it your hand that was raised? Sure, yeah. Um, just one additional thing that has been a takeaway from um, our our Play USA programs has been uh, the ways in which young people feel like their voice is really heard within these programs. Oftentimes they're operating in the after school space and we have been noticing that sometimes young people may not make it to the school day for Zoom, but they will always make it to the to the after school program and uh, and sort of this understanding of how young people show up and how young people, um, their voices are integrated into the program delivery um, has been a, a really great takeaway. And just to address quickly this other question around how removing geographical barriers um, to arts education, certainly for students, um, all of these ideas are fantastic. I think for teachers also thinking about how are we able to take a peek into other classrooms and, and share strategies and share resources. Um, in Play USA, we encourage and, and softly require organizations to submit um, sort of three different points of, of learning, whether that's a classroom, um, Zoom class to share. And we're finding you know a lot of shared strategies, shared games, uh, tech setups with different microphones and, and video cams. Um, teachers are really hustling to find the best setups that will support their student learning. And, uh, and so just being able to have that conversation in addition to how to engage students, also how to create sustainable and supportive environments for teachers um, to be able to navigate where whether this turns into hybrid learning, in-person virtual, or, or whether it continues to be virtual, we assume it will change regionally. So it's been great to have that conversation as well. There's one other question, um, and some of this you may have already touched on, but if, you, if there's more to add, the question is, how do you increase and encourage youth connecting and supporting each other? What tools and approaches worked?
I can say a little bit about that because it's something we were quite concerned about going into the program. You know, the one of the most powerful takeaways from the experience has always been joining this community of peers and and making truly lifelong friends. Um, and, and we didn't know how that would work. And I, I, I will say most of it, the students figured out on their own. They are very um, interested in interaction. Like the first, you know, big meeting of, of the entire group, there was already like, who's gonna set up the Discord server so we can, you know, connect further. Um, they planned, a number of things that they wanted to do outside of the formal framework that would allow them to collaborate, put, you know, virtual smaller virtual performances out there. Um, I mean, we we took one one step, which was to specifically set aside some social time that was facilitated by a, a near peer. We asked uh, alums of the program to come back and do that facilitation. And a lot of that was just like finding an online game that you know, the 10 people in that group wanted wanted to play or to do some, you know, uh, listening together. Um, uh, but, you know, we we just made it clear that we were we were happy to support it. And, you know, you know, when there when there was material that came out of it that they wanted to share publicly, that we would we would post it on on our social channels and and that kind of thing. So um, I think just just Con convening them uh, when it's a group that's not already in contact just unleashes a, a lot of uh, desire to connect um, and and you know just just giving them the space to do that you know that the, the that social time was completely unmoderated by staff and and we wanted it to be theirs just to have fun same uh, similarly for dance, you know, opening the studio early, <laughs> you know, and just having them hang. Uh, and after they were about halfway through the program, just having some dedicated, just unstructured time where staff, we would be in the corner, we'd have one person off camera, we're like, you know, it's your time. We're just here for safety because the lawyers say somebody has to be here. Right. But we're really not like all up in your business. <laughs> just, you know, do you. And that worked out fine. Along with all the things that Doug is saying about how they kind of manage their own social relationships on the plethora of platforms that are out there in the world. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, in our final moments, I would just pose the final question to our informal panelists, as well as our formal panelists. And that is in one or two words, how have you or have we changed for the better within the last 12 months? And so our informal panelists, please share that in the chat. And for our panelists, just feel free to come off of mute. In one or two words, how have you or we changed for the better within the last 12 months? Better listening. Mm, better listening. say more authentic connection. Yes. I was going to say strengthened flexibility. Mm. Become more curious about adapting. Mm. Beautiful. Doug? I'm not good at like two words, but it's definitely, I, and I think we as humans have it, but I think in these moments, we, we just realize how adaptable and flexible to echo, you know, uh, we are and just like that, that's powerful. And yeah, that's many, many too many words. <laughs> We love all the words, Doug. We love all of them. I think I go to agility and opportunity. And certainly today, I am full of gratitude for everything that you have shared with us. Um, it has been such a treat to spend time with you and to be 
uh, just witness to all the brilliant things that you are providing, all the people that you are supporting and lifting up, students and professionals alike. And Adam, I'm curious about you. What are your words? And I'll allow um, you to wrap us up. Mine are critical connections. I've, I read Grace Lee Boggs's book, um, The Next American Revolution. Grace Lee Boggs, for those of you who might not be familiar, is amazing, historic, important Detroit activist. Um, and one of her quotes is not critical mass that creates change, but critical connections create critical change. And so, yeah, I just am feeling that type of way, being connected to all of you and having, you know, this amazing audience here too, connected to your work and each other. And yeah, just having a space where, you know, everybody's been sharing um, their connections in their own work and between students to arts, to Leslie Odom Jr., to MTV music videos and dancing, you know, to, um, so I just, I just think there's a lot of power in all of those connections at every level of the work that you all are doing, that we're all doing. And yeah, it's just really powerful and amazing to see. And, you know, thanks so much to Heather for facilitating this as well. You know, we're coming from lots of different angles here, music, dance, visual arts, and Heather did a great job, Philadelphia, New York, <laughs> DC, and Heather did a wonderful job bringing it all here to Michigan too. So thanks so much everybody for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna let Yen share her screen to just show us maybe just one of the images she, she's worked on too, because I know that she has three, but we'll also send those out in the follow-up email uh, with a recording too. Um, you can also learn more about Yen's work at the following links below. And um, for those of you who are interested in joining us, we have a hack session following this program that starts in just about a minute. Um, and we'll focus all on lighting and audio with Detroit Public Television. So join me there. Um, I just dropped the link in the chat for that too. Um, here is Yen's wonderful visual um, time-lapse. And yeah, a huge thank you to everybody for joining us, um, Lisa, Doug, um, Karen, Elena, and Vanessa. Um, really appreciate you all beaming in and your, your wonderful insights. It's great to be connected and um, yeah, share the space with you all. So thanks everybody again for tuning in um, and uh, hear more about our Culture Source programs and stay tuned with what we're up to um, at culturesource.org. We'll see you all later. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again, Heather, too, for facilitating, if I didn't mention that already. My pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure and honor. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.